Book Two, Chapter Nine of Kipps by H. G. Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. One. You imagine them fleeing through our complex and difficult social system, as it were, for life, first on foot and severally to the Folkestone Central Station, then in a first-class carriage with Kipps' bag as sole chaperone to Charing Cross, and then in a four-wheeler a long rumbling palpitating slow flight through the multitudinous swarming london streets to sid kipps kept peeping out of the window it's the next corner after this i believe he would say for he had a sort of feeling that at sid's he would be immune from the hottest pursuits he paid the cabman in a manner adequate to the occasion and turned to his prospective brother-in-law me and Anne, he said we're going to marry. But I thought, began Sid. Kipps motioned him towards explanations in the shop. It's no good my arguing with you, said Sid, smiling delightedly as the case unfolded. You've done it now. And Masterman, being apprised of the nature of the affair, descended slowly in a state of flushed congratulation. I thought you might find the higher life a bit difficult, said Masterman, projecting a bony hand but i never thought you'd have the originality to clear out won't the young lady of the superior classes swear never mind it doesn't matter anyhow you are starting a climb he said at dinner that doesn't lead anywhere you would have clambered from one refinement of vulgarity to another and never got to any satisfactory top there isn't a top it's a squirrel's cage things are out of joint and the only top there is is a lot of blazing card-playing women and betting men. You should read modern society, seasoned with archbishops and officials and all that sort of glossy, pandering bosh. You'd have hung on a disconsolate, dismal little figure somewhere up the ladder, far below even the motor-car class, while your wife larked about, or fretted because she wasn't a bit higher than she was. I found it all out long ago. I've seen women of that sort and I don't climb any more. I often thought about what you said last time I saw you, said Kipps. I wonder what I said, said Masterman in parenthesis. Anyhow, you're doing the right and sane thing, and that's a rare spectacle. You're going to marry your equal, and you're going to take your own line, quite independently of what people up there or people down there think you ought or ought not to do. That's about the only course one can take nowadays, with everything getting more muddled and upside down every day. Make your own little world and your own house first of all. Keep that right side up, whatever you do, and marry a mate. That, I suppose, is what I should do, if I had a mate. But people of my sort, luckily for the world, don't get made in pairs. No. Besides, however, and abruptly taking advantage of an interruption by Master Walt, he lapsed into thought. Presently he came out of his musings. After all, he said, there's hope. What about? said Sid. Everything, said Masterman. Where there's life there's hope, said Mrs. Sid, but none of you aren't eating anything like you ought to. Masterman lifted his glass. Here's to hope, he said. The light of the world. Sid beamed at Kipps, as who should say, you don't meet a character like this every dinner time. His to hope, repeated Masterman. The best thing one can have. Hope of life, yes. He imposed his movement of magnificent self-pity on them all. Even young Walt was impressed. They spent the days before their marriage in a number of agreeable excursions together. One day they went to Kew by steamboat and admired the house full of paintings of flowers extremely and one day they went early to have a good long day at the Crystal Palace, and enjoyed themselves very much indeed. They got there so early that nothing was open inside. All the stalls were wrapped up, and all the minor exhibitions locked and barred. They seemed the minutest creatures even to themselves in that enormous empty aisle, and their echoing footsteps indecently loud. They contemplated realistic groups of plaster savages, and Anne thought they'd be queer people to have about, she was glad there were none in this country. They meditated upon replicas of classical statuary without excessive comment. Kipps said at large it must have been a queer world then, 
but Anne very properly doubted if they really went about like that. But the place at that early hour was really lonely. One began to fancy things. So they went out into the October sunshine of the mighty terraces, and wandered amidst miles of stucco tanks and about those quiet gargantuan grounds. A great grey emptiness it was, and it seemed marvellous to them, but not nearly so marvellous as it might have seemed. "'I never see a finer place, never,' said Kipps, turning to survey the entirety of the enormous glass front with Paxton's vast image in the centre. "'Well, it must have cost to build,' said Anne, and left her sentence eloquently incomplete. Presently they came to a region of caves and waterways, and amidst these waterways strange reminders of the possibilities of the Creator. They passed under an arch made of a whale's jaws, and discovered amidst herbage, as if they were browsing or standing unoccupied and staring as if amazed at themselves, huge effigies of iguanodons and dinotheria and mastodons and such-like cattle, gloriously done in green and gold. "'They got everything,' said Kipps. "'Oh's court isn't a patch on it.' His mind was very greatly exercised by these monsters, and he hovered about them and returned to them. "'You wonder how they ever got enough to eat,' he said several times. 2. It was later in the day, and upon a seat in the presence of the green and gold labyrinthodon that loomed so splendidly about the lake, that the Kippses fell into talk about their future. They had made a sufficient lunch in the palace, they had seen pictures and no end of remarkable things, and that and the amber sunlight made a mood for them, quiet and philosophical, a heaven mood. Kipps broke a contemplative silence with an abrupt allusion to one principal preoccupation. "'I shall offer an apology, and I shall offer her brother damages, if she likes to bring an action for breach after that. Well, I've done all I can. They can't get much out of reading my letters in court, because I didn't write none. I dare say a thousand or two will settle all that, anyhow. I ain't much worried about that. That don't worry me very much, Anne. No.' And then, "'It's a lot I'm marrying. It's curious how things come about. If I hadn't run against you, where should I have been now, eh? Even after we met, I didn't seem to see it like, not marrying you, I mean, until that night I came. I didn't, really.' "'I didn't neither,' said Anne, with thoughtful eyes on the water. For a time Kipp's mind was occupied by the prettiness of her thinking face. A faint tremulous network of lights reflected from the ripples of a passing duck played subtly over her cheek and faded away. Anne reflected. "'I suppose things had to be,' she said. Kipps mused. "'It's curious, however, I got on to be engaged to her.' "'She wasn't suited to you,' said Anne. "'Suited? No fear. That's just it. How'd it come about?' "'I expect she led you on,' said Anne. "'Kipps was half-minded to assent. "'Then he had a twinge of conscience. "'It wasn't that, Anne,' he said. "'It's curious. I don't know what it was, but it wasn't that. "'I don't recollect. No. Life's jolly rum. "'That's one thing, anyhow. "'And I suppose I'm a rum sort of feller. "'I get excited sometimes, and then I don't seem to care what I do.' That's about what it was, really. Still, they meditated, Kipps with his arms folded and pulling at his scanty moustache. Presently a faint smile came over his face. We'll get a nice little house out either way. It's homelier than Folkestone, said Anne. Just a nice little house, said Kipps. There's Ewenden, of course, but that's let, besides being miles too big, and I wouldn't live in Folkestone again somehow, not for anything. I'd like to have an house of my own, said Anne. I often thought being in service how much I'd like to manage an house of my own. You'd know all about what the servants was up to anyhow, said Kipps, amused. Servants? We don't want no servants, said Anne, startled. You'll have to have a servant, said Kipps, if it's only to do the heavy work of the house. "'What, and not be able hardly to go into my own kitchen?' said Anne. "'You ought to have a servant,' said Kipps. "'One could easy have a woman in for anything that's heavy,' said Anne. "'Besides, 
If I had one of the girls one sees about nowadays, I should want to be taking the broom out of her and do it all over myself. I'd manage better without her. We ought to have one servant anyhow, said Kipps. Else how shall we manage if we wanted to go out together or anything like that? I might get a young girl, said Anne, and bring her up in my own way. Kipps left the matter at that and came back to the house. There's little houses going into Ithe, just the sort we want, not too big and not too small. We'll have a kitchen and a dining room and a little room to sit in of a night. It mustn't be an house with a basement, said Anne. What's a basement? It's a downstairs where there's not half enough light and everything got to be carried. Up and down, up and down all day, coals and everything. And it's got to have a water tap and sink and things upstairs. You'd hardly believe, Artie, if you hadn't been in service, how cruel and silly some houses are built. You'd think they had a spite against servants, the way the stairs are made. We won't have one of that sort, said Kipps. We'll have a quiet little life. Now go out a bit, now come home again. Read a book, perhaps, we've got nothing else to do. Have old Buggins in for an evening at times. Have Sid down. There's bicycles. I don't fancy myself on a bicycle, said Anne. Have a trailer, said Kipps, and sit like a lady. I'd take you out to New Romney, easy as anything, just to see the old people. I wouldn't mind that, said Anne. We'll just have a sensible little house and sensible things. No art or anything of that sort, nothing stuck up or anything, but just sensible. We'll be as right as anything, Anne. No socialism, said Anne, starting a lurking doubt. No socialism, said Kipps. Just sensible, that's all. I dare say it's all right for them that understand it, Artie, but I don't agree with this socialism. I don't neither, really, said Kipps. I can't argue about it, but it doesn't seem real like to me. All the same, Masterman's a clever fellow, Anne. I didn't like him at first, Artie, but I do now, in a way. You don't understand him all at once. He's so clever said Kipps. Half the time I can't make out what he's up to. He's the cleverest chap I ever met. I never heard such talking. He ought to write a book. It's a rum world, Anne, when a chap like that isn't hardly able to earn a living. It's his elf, said Anne. I expect it is, said Kipps, and ceased to talk for a little while. Then he spoke with deliberation. Sea air might be the saving of him, Anne. He glanced doubtfully at Anne, and she was looking at him even fondly. "'You think of other people a lot,' said Anne. "'I've been looking at you, sitting there and thinking.' "'I suppose I do. I suppose when one's happy, one does.' "'You do,' said Anne. "'We shall be happy in that little house, Anne, don't you think?' She met his eyes and nodded. "'I seem to see it,' said Kip, "'sort of cosy-like, about tea-time and muffins.' Kettle on the ob, cat on the hearthrug. We must get a cat, Anne. And you there, eh? They regarded each other with appreciative eyes, and Kipps became irrelevant. I don't believe, Anne, he said. I haven't kissed you, not for half an hour. Leastways, not since we was in these caves. For kissing had already ceased to be a matter of thrilling adventure for them. Anne shook her head. You be sensible and go on talking about Mr. Masterman, she said. But Kipps had wandered to something else. I like the way your hair turns back just there, he said with an indicative finger. It was like that, I remember, when you was a girl, sort of wavy. I've often thought of it. Remember when we raced that time out behind the church? Then for a time they sat idly, each following out agreeable meditations. It's rum, said Kipps. What's rum? How oh, everything's happened, said Kipps. Who'd have thought of our being here like this six weeks ago? Who'd have thought of my ever having any money? His eyes went to the big labyrinthodon. He looked first carelessly and then suddenly with a growing interest in its vast face. I'm dashed, he murmured. Anne became interested. He laid a hand on her arm and pointed. Anne scrutinised the labyrinthodon, and then came around to Kipps' face in mute interrogation. "'Don't you see it?' said Kipps. "'See what?' 
He's just like old Coop. It's extinct, said Anne, not clearly apprehending. I dare say it is, but it's just like old Coop, all the same for that. Kipps meditated on the monstrous shapes in sight. I wonder how all these old antediluvian animals got extinct, he asked. No one couldn't have possibly have killed them. Why, I know that, said Anne. They was overtook by the flood. Kipps meditated for a while. But I thought they had to take two of everything there was. Within reason they had, said Anne. The Kippses left it at that. The great green and gold labyrinthodon took no notice of their conversation. It gazed with its wonderful eyes over their heads into the infinite, inflexibly calm. It might indeed have been Coote himself there, Coote, the unassuming, cutting them dead. 3. And in due course these two simple souls married, and Venus Urania, the goddess of wedded love, the goddess of tolerant kindliness or meeting halfway, to whom all young couples should pray and offer sacrifices of self, who is indeed a very great and noble and kindly goddess, was in some manner propitiated, and bent down and blessed them in their union. End of Book Two